Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky spoke to the U.S. Congress. He is urging lawmakers to help create a no-fly zone and to provide more weapons to counter Russian air power. Russia and Ukraine sounding more upbeat about peace talks, focusing on compromise, while NATO vows to keep helping Ukraine. Ukrainian medical workers set up a temporary field hospital in a basement in the Kyiv region. They have prepared emergency medical supplies, including antibiotics and dressings to treat patients. Have you developed ringing in your ears after getting the COVID vaccine? Researchers now say there's an overwhelming need to investigate tinnitus stemming from the vaccine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addressed both houses of Congress virtually this morning. He urged lawmakers to provide more military aid as his country continues to fight Russian airstrikes. Russia has attacked not just us, not just our land, not just our cities. It went on a brutal offensive against our values, basic human values. It threw tanks and planes against our freedom, against our right to live freely in our own country, choosing our own future. Zelensky renewed his plea for U.S. help to create a no-fly zone over Ukraine. But the White House and NATO officials see the request as a non-starter. President Biden said implementing such a measure would escalate the conflict with Russia, a nuclear power. In concession, the Ukrainian president is calling for the U.S. to provide fighter jets, He also called on the U.S. Congress to do more, including economic sanctions against Moscow. Zelensky later spoke about the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He also mentioned Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, which thrust the United States into World War II. Friends, Americans, in your great history, you have pages that would allow you to understand Ukrainians. Understand us now when you need it right now. Now, when we need you right now, remember Pearl Harbor, terrible morning of December 7, 1941, when your sky was black from the planes attacking you. Just remember it. Remember September the 11th. Zelensky also expressed gratitude to President Biden's over $13 billion aid. After the speech, Representative Jason Crow said Congress needs to push for more security guarantees in Ukraine. Senator Lindsey Graham speaks to media about a Senate resolution urging the Biden administration to assist the Ukrainian government. He is calling on the administration to help facilitate the transfer of aircraft and air defense systems to Ukraine. A White House official confirmed earlier that Biden would announce another $800 million in security aid for Ukraine. Altogether, the president has authorized $2 billion in aid for Ukraine since taking office. By far, the U.S. remains the largest single donor of security assistance to Ukraine. Both Russia and Ukraine are speaking of compromise as peace talks continue. The Kremlin said a neutral Ukraine is one possible solution. NTD's Jessica Beatty reports. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Wednesday that peace talks must lead to a fair deal for Ukraine and protect it from future threats. We can and must negotiate a just but fair peace for Ukraine. Real security guarantees that will work. He also said Russia's demands at the talks are sounding more realistic. A Russian official also sounded upbeat. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said a, quote, business-like spirit is emerging at the talks. And Russia's top negotiator told State TV earlier, quote, Ukraine's offering an Austrian or Swedish version of a neutral, demilitarized state, but at the same time, a state with its own army and navy. Ukraine has not confirmed it's willing to discuss neutrality. Footage shows more Russian bombardments in Ukraine's capital Wednesday morning. This apartment building was hit. Residents were evacuated and are being treated for injuries. Zelensky invited supporters of Ukraine to visit the capital, but he warned that it could be dangerous. Three European leaders visited Kyiv Tuesday to show their support. They've returned home safely. Meanwhile, the United States and other NATO members said Wednesday they would keep helping Ukraine fight off Russia's invasion. 
Here's U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. We remain united uh, in our support of Ukraine. We support uh, their ability to defend themselves, and we'll continue to support them going forward. Experts estimate that NATO allies have sent more than 20,000 weapons to Ukraine since the invasion started. Although Ukraine is not a member of NATO, the country has repeatedly said it wants to join. But on Tuesday, Zelensky said Ukraine realized it wouldn't happen. Russia views NATO as a threat and has opposed Ukraine's efforts to join. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Russia quits Europe's leading human rights watchdog. The Council of Europe was expected to expel Russia over the war anyway, but now Russia is the second country to ever leave the group. The Council of Europe is tasked with upholding human rights and the rule of law in Europe. It also helped Eastern European nations democratize after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was created after World War II. Greece left the group in 1969 after a military coup. It rejoined after restoring democracy five years later. Russia's withdrawal from the institution means the Human Rights Convention will not apply. Its citizens will not be able to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights against their government. Russia says NATO and the European Union see the Council as a way to support their political and economic expansion to the east. Russian aviation authorities have fired an official who said that China refused to supply Russian airlines with aircraft parts. Russia is seeking the parts to overcome the effects of sanctions on its airline industry. Valery Kudinov was an official responsible for airplane airworthiness. He said Russia was talking to India and Turkey about aircraft parts supply after failing to get parts from China. Russia's Commerçant newspaper reported the news of his firing. Commerçant cited Kudinov as saying he was fired for disclosing information under a federal law governing the behavior of civil servants. Sanctions have cut off most supplies of aircraft parts from Russia. The United States and Europe have also closed their airspace to Russian airplanes, airlines, and Russia has done the same to U.S. and European airlines. A U.S. Air Force cargo jet is shipping helmets and other non-lethal military equipment donated by Japan to Ukraine. This marks the first time an American aircraft has been used to carry Japanese self-defense force equipment to another country. These supplies will soon be heading to Europe on a United States aircraft to help the brave citizens of Ukraine in their fight for their freedom and against Russia. The C-17 transport jet flying from the United States touched down at the Yokota Air Base in western Tokyo. It was there to pick up three truckloads of plastic wrapped boxes. Japan's government declined to provide a list of what equipment was inside. Ground crews at the U.S. military's transport hub loaded the cargo onto the C-17, which can carry around 77 tons. Japan has followed its U.S. ally and other Western nations by imposing tough sanctions on Russia. There's concern that Russia's attack could embolden neighboring China to use its military in East Asia. Japan renounced the right to wage war after its defeat in World War II. The country follows strict rules that ban weapons exports to conflict zones or countries not subject to United Nations resolutions. While fighting continues in Ukraine, medical workers have set up a temporary field hospital and a bomb shelter in the Kyiv region. Staff have converted rooms in the shelter into wards with mattresses on the floor. Here are the details. A temporary field hospital near Kyiv has emergency medical supplies, including antibiotics, dressings and equipment to treat patients. Staff have piled sandbags against the windows, and a Ukrainian flag is draped over a table that also holds medical supplies. We can receive fighters, the wounded, provide first aid, stop bleeding, dress wounds. I have trained paramedics to assist me as well as undergraduate medical students who are well adapted, who are not afraid, and know what to do. Staff use plastic sheets to create pre-surgery and operating rooms. Here, we prepared beds for 25 patients. They all come with clean bedding, so the patients will feel totally safe and comfortable here. Here, we have everything needed for resuscitation and more. First aid medication, like antibiotics, adrenaline, everything that is needed. Syringes, antiseptics, antibiotics, we have everything. Dressing stuff as well. 
The place was originally just an unused basement. Our hospital was built by people who cared, from the local community, volunteers, members of territorial defense, and just our friends, who came and did it with all the enthusiasm and inspiration. A convoy of trucks carrying 200 tons of humanitarian aid from the International Committee of the Red Cross reached Ukraine on Tuesday. In the coming days, in the coming weeks, the International Committee of the Red Cross, its partners, will continue this humanitarian assistance uh, operations. The aid includes war-wounded medical kits, relief packages, and water and sanitation supplies. They will be delivered across Ukraine depending on security conditions. Ukrainian President Zelensky says the country must accept that it will never join NATO. This comes as the number of Ukrainians fleeing the country surpasses 3 million. Here to give us an update from the Polish-Ukrainian border is Ukrainian parliament advisor Mykola Volkivsky. He explains the challenges to refugees following Poland's statement that the country cannot take any more displaced Ukrainians. For the first three or four nights, it was, you know, incredibly difficult to, to you know, to explain them, Ukrainians. It's, it's every fun what they're doing by the European Union, European Union side. It's just for free, like volunteers try to help the Ukrainians. Now we have big problem, not a problem, but, you know, last two weeks, the Polish population grew up for per 2% more now because more than 2 million Ukrainians now in Poland. I used to talk with Deputy Mayor of Przemysl, it's a city near Polish-Ukrainian border. They said it crossed Medica Shigini, which is the border, they crossed more than half million Ukrainian last three weeks. Okay, it's, it's less numbers uh, between Romania and Ukraine and Hungary, but we will see this all situations now it's grew up. Okay, most of these people don't stay in Poland anymore because it's no no more refugees, no more Ukrainians. It's was said not more place to accommodate in Krakow, in Warsaw. They, you know, try to go much further to Germany, to France. They you know even they can have a possibility to travel directly from Poland, from Poland border to France or Germany. Now, Russia invaded Ukraine with the goal of denazifying the country. Is there anything that suggests that this is a real problem in Ukraine? Oh, like, as the truth, you know, how it's possible to, to use the term denazification in my country? Like, I'm Ukrainian. How to use, like, I speak, like, a few languages. But at the same time, there, uh, Putin said he tried to denazificate my country. At the same time, he tried, you know, to destroy the Ukrainian satellite in Kiev, which is near Babi Yar Memorial, which is the main the place when a lot of Jews was killed during World Second War 75 years ago. He's put his missiles and shooting directly to this Babi Yar Memorial. At the same time, the Ukrainian rabbi asked, how is it possible, you know, to be in denazification at the same time they're shooting on the memorial of the Jews who were World Second War? It's completely untrue. Ringing in the ears, or tinnitus, in connection to COVID vaccines is coming into the spotlight. A group of researchers evaluated the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, they found that there is a need to study the relationship between tinnitus and the COVID vaccine more closely. Tinnitus is when a person hears ringing or other sounds that are not coming from the outside world. The researchers said it's rare for this to occur following the vaccine, but there are still a substantial amount of cases. Specifically, as of September 2021, over 12,000 cases of tinnitus following the vaccine were reported. That's according to an article published in the Annals of Medicine and Surgery. Researchers argued that since there is a relatively high number of cases, there is an overwhelming need to determine exactly how tinnitus comes about after getting the vaccine. Now, the researchers pointed out that stress and anxiety sometimes follow vaccination. They say that could be playing a role and is something that should be evaluated. Though the lead researcher and others with the Dow University of Health Sciences say they believe the benefits of the vaccine still outweigh the side effects. And a specific example of this ringing in the ears is Dr. Gregory Poland. He heads the Mayo Clinic's vaccine research group in Minnesota. He told MedPage Today that he developed tinnitus soon after he got his first shot. He said it was like someone blew a dog whistle in his ear. He says the symptoms of his tinnitus have been life-altering and unrelenting. 
but he says he's still a proponent of the vaccine and has received a booster. Federal assistance to cover the costs of funerals for COVID victims has now topped $2 billion. That's according to the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Applications for federal help paying for COVID-related death expenses opened almost a year ago. The program gives families up to $9,000 to cover the cost of coffins, transfer of remains, headstones, and other funeral-related expenses. FEMA has distributed funds on more than 300,000 applications. The agency is planning to launch an advertising campaign aimed at areas with high COVID death rates but low registration for its program. A new audit shows former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's administration undercounted COVID-19 deaths in nursing homes by over 4,000. The audit accuses the state of misleading the public. The New York State Comptroller released the audit Tuesday. It accuses the New York State Department of Health of undercounting the number of nursing home deaths by more than 50 percent at certain points. The audit states that the lack of transparency could potentially stem from a poor quality data early in the outbreak, but also says it was likely a deliberate decision at certain periods. It says that when health department officials were questioned about the incorrect data, they could not explain it. The New York Health Department pushed back against the findings and said it's the fault of the executive chamber of the prior administration and not department personnel. Cuomo's administration has also faced heavy criticism for issuing a controversial order at the start of the pandemic that forced nursing homes to accept elderly people who had tested positive for COVID-19. For the second year in a row, the National Park Service is denying a request from the South Dakota to hold a July 4th fireworks celebration at Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore Superintendent Michelle Wheatley explained the decision in a Monday letter to the South Dakota Department of Tourism. Wheatley cited concerns including the potential for wildfires and complaints from some local Native American Indian tribes. South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem filed a lawsuit last year when the National Park Service denied a similar request. A federal judge dismissed the suit. The state appealed, and that appeal is still pending. Noem released a statement criticizing the most recent decision. The governor said she would continue a court battle to hold the fireworks. Noem successfully pushed for a return of the event in Mount Rushmore in 2020 after a decade-long hiatus. The University of Florida removed Karl Marx's name from a library study room. That's after it gained media attention. The room also contains a plaque with a glowing description of the Communist Manifesto author. A March 7th report by Campus Reform says the public university had one of its 14 group study rooms at its library named Karl Marx Study Room. In a photo publicized by the education news site, Marx's name is inscribed on a plaque at the room's entrance along with text praising his achievements. The school says the name was put there in 2014. The library's online booking system had displayed the name before, but now it only refers to it by a number. Karl Marx study room is now room 229. In a statement to campus reform, the university said the name change has to do with the conflict in Ukraine and other current events. Little Miss Nobody finally has a name. A little girl whose burned remains were found over 60 years ago in the Arizona desert was four-year-old Sharon Lee Gallegos of New Mexico. That's according to the Vavapai County Sheriff's Office. The child's remains were found on July 31, 1960. They were partially burned in in a wash in Congress, Arizona. Her age was then estimated at between three and six years old. Residents in the nearby central North Arizona community of Prescott raised money for a funeral and florists and a mortuary donated their services. News reports at the time said a local radio announcer and his wife stood in for the girl's parents during the funeral at Prescott's Congregational Church. Sharon Lee Gallegos was reportedly abducted from behind her home in Alamogordo, New Mexico, on July 21, 1960, a little over a week before her body was found. Authorities say they do not know who took and killed the child. The remains were exhumed to get DNA samples. The National Center for Exploited and Missing Children 
the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, and others worked on the case. The Sheriff's Office and Texas DNA company, Orthram, raised $4,000 earlier this year to pay for specialized testing that finally identified the girl. A close call caught on camera. A motorcyclist crashed on a rising bridge on, in Daytona Beach, Florida, narrowly missing a fall into the Halifax River below. The Georgia biker in town for a bike week. He crashed through a lowered traffic arm and jumped off his bike. The motorcycle ended up dangling over the river by its trailer. The man was taken to the hospital with injuries that were not life-threatening. He told police he didn't see the lowered traffic arm because he was wiping rain off his helmet's face shield. Police say the crash caused $5,000 in damage to the motorcycle. The driver was charged with careless driving, which has a fine of about $160. Still to come, two developers transfer warehouses and other abandoned properties into homeless shelters, hoping to address California's homelessness crisis. And fashion rules have changed as employees return to the office. A Hollywood fashion stylist explains what's hot and what's not. Find out more in just a moment. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. You worked hard for your money. You invest in stability for your retirement and your family's future to build and leave them with something greater. The next unprecedented financial crisis, political misstep, or unstable government can depreciate it all away. It was called the gold standard for a reason, the financial preservation of tomorrow. Diversify your assets against inflation, market volatility, and the unknown with real money. Hedge your wealth with the purest form of money, physical gold and silver. Because any currency printed on paper can be manipulated. What's backing up your IRA? Do what you need to do right now to be prepared with the Reagan Gold Group. Visit now rggusakit.com or call us at 866-912-1384. Receive up to $2,500 in free silver coins and a free safe with your new precious metals IRA. Call now. Two developers are transforming properties into homeless shelters in California, hoping to address one of the state's most visible issues. But some critics say the initiative is just a short-term solution. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. Property developers Ryan and Jeremy Ogilnick converted an industrial space in Santa Ana in 28 days. They did the same with properties in neighboring Anaheim and Fullerton in a matter of months. They are due to open yet another remodeled Santa Ana site next week. The model is fairly simple. We'll take vacant warehouses, vacant office buildings, no different than building out tenant improvements for an insurance company, a, a tech company, and within 30 to, it depends on the magnitude of the, of the build out, between 30 days and nine months, we can build out a fully operating shelter. Orange County has a homeless population of some 7,000 people, nearly 60% of them unsheltered. Two residents found the Fullerton shelter friendlier than others where they have stayed. They're giving me the tools that I need and the right mindset that I'm gonna need to be able to succeed on my own and to do everything for myself. Jennifer Payek, 57, became homeless after her husband died. 
before she found her way to the Fullerton Navigation Center. Everybody here, to me, they're very nice. Everybody. <laughs> so I just love the people here. I don't mind staying whatever, but I do need to get some privacy, so I really do need to move, move to a private <laughs> room. Quick and efficient as these shelters may be, they are only a short-term fix. Some critics are concerned Orange County doesn't have a permanent solution. The focus really has been of many of the cities of Orange County in recognizing that there's a problem, talking through solutions to the problem, and then going for the quick fix to the visibility and not the permanent solution to the problem. According to a 2021 study by the National Low Income Housing Coalition, the United States was about 7 million units short of sufficient affordable housing. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Amazon is moving workers out of its office in downtown Seattle due to a wave of violent crime. The company joins a growing list of businesses in the area taking drastic steps to protect their employees and customers. NTD's Grace Coulter has the story. Amazon is temporarily relocating workers out of its downtown Seattle office due to a spike in violent crimes in the area. Roughly 1,800 Amazon employees are assigned to the office, located in the heart of Seattle on 3rd Avenue and Pine Street. An Amazon spokesman said in a statement to the Seattle Times Friday that the move was prompted by recent incidents near 3rd and Pine. Recent violent crimes in the area include the fatal shooting of a 15-year-old on March 2nd. Police said Monday the shooter is still at large. According to the Seattle Police Department, since February 21st, there have been at least three shootings, two stabbings and one carjacking in the area. Como News reporter Jonathan Cho captured this footage of police patrolling the area near Amazon's office after the company's announcement. Cho posted the videos to Twitter and wrote, even with Seattle Police Department on patrol, parts of 3rd Ave remain an open-air drug den and a bazaar of stolen merch. Downtown Seattle is turning into a bad episode of Cops. Cho has shared several other recent videos of the downtown area. Here you can see tents, trash and homeless people sleeping on the sidewalk. And Amazon isn't the only business taking drastic measures to protect their staff. Some are even shutting down. At the end of February, Poroshki Poroshki closed their location nearby at 3rd Ave and Pike Street because they said the area is no longer safe for employees. According to Cho, the McDonald's in downtown Seattle also closed the day after Poroshki Poroshki, citing safety concerns. He took this video of people doing drugs in the doorway of the shuttered McDonald's. Seattle Mayor Bruce Hurrell's office told Fox News he's working to make downtown safer, but added it may take time. Amazon says it will bring employees back to the downtown office when it's safe to do so. Grace Coulter, NTD News. As employees return to the workplace in 2022, there are some new rules for some businesses on what to wear. The couture may be more casual, but that does not mean the look is anything unprofessional. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. Business attire and fashion rules are loosening slightly as many employees return to the workplace. The pandemic prompted a re-evaluation of what business wardrobe means for some industries and how strictly that style must be followed. As we get back to work and back into the workplace, interacting with our co-workers, the key here for gentlemen is to remember that you have a lot of choices. And many of the employers, many of our large corporations are allowing us to be a little more casual, still keeping a professional image, but not having to wear a full suit. The return to work fashion is different for each company, depending on the profession and how many clients the employee will interact with at work but there are still some hard rules. Most importantly, when it comes to the nose for gentlemen, remember that you still need to wear a dress shoe. No sneakers, no sneakers, no sneakers. Now, you have to be mindful of your industry, but the key here is that your shoes will always elevate your image. Many experts believe that coming out of lockdown has made some more confident about dressing down in a comfortable yet self-expressive way. Going back to work has also sparked new ideas over the way clothing items can be curated together. 
you can be in a position where you can now switch your bottoms and your top and also wear colors that are dedicated to the season, specifically in the softer tones, softer pinks, softer blues, rather than the bold of those exact same colors, because we're getting reacclimated and reacquainted with our coworkers. As many return to the workplace, there are still others working through Zoom and other digital platforms. The Future Forum, developed by workplace app Slack, surveyed more than 1,000 workers around the world last summer and found that 44% of executives wanted to come back to the office, but only 17% of employees wanted to. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Customs and Border Protection officials are seizing record amounts of illegal meat products from China. Between October and December 2021, at the Los Angeles and Long Beach ports, Agents seized more than 262,000 pounds of pork, chicken, beef, and duck products. That's a 33% increase from the year before. Illegal meat imports from China reached a peak in 2021 when agents at the California ports uncovered nearly 787,000 pounds. That represents an 80% increase from the year before. When illegally shipped meat is intercepted, the agency says it either destroys it or sends it back to China. Agents at the ports found most of the illegal meat stored with boxes of e-commerce shipments and households goods. Also, from October to December of last year, more than 1,900 pounds of prohibited meat products from China were seized from New York City area retailers. According to the USDA, China is known to have cases of African swine fever, classical swine fever, foot and mouth disease, bird flu, and other virulent diseases. A strong earthquake jolted Japan's northeast coast on Wednesday, shaking buildings. It left parts of Tokyo without power and triggered a tsunami warning. The tremor registered magnitude 7.3 and as high as a 6-plus on the Japanese shaking intensity scale in some areas, too strong for people to stand, according to public broadcaster NHK. Japan's prime minister said the government is working to assess the extent of any damage. The same region was hit by a major earthquake following a tsunami in 2011. That triggered the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Tokyo Electric Power Company told NHK that around 2 million households are without power and that it is checking the condition of reactors at the Fukushima plant. Authorities warned residents in Fukushima Migagi and Yamagata to expect aftershocks. Taiwan is ramping up military exercises amid mounting threats from China. Beyond that, an intelligence report suggests that Chinese leader Xi Jinping could well launch an attack on the island this fall. Taiwan held its latest round of military drills in its northernmost territory, called Dongying. It's a remote island directly off the coast of China. That's according to footage released by the Taiwan Military News Agency. In the video, soldiers fired shells at floating red crosses representing the enemy. Echoes of machine guns and cannons were heard around the shoreline. Taiwan didn't reveal details of its military presence in Dongying, but the region has been on the front lines of Taiwan's defense range since the 1950s. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Taipei has been on high alert looking to prevent Beijing from taking similar action against Taiwan. Although no signs of Chinese military action have been detected yet, a recent intelligence report from the Russian Federal Security Service is calling for renewed attention. The leaked document says China's Communist Party leader Xi Jinping was, quote, at least considering taking over Taiwan in the fall. That's to get himself re-elected for a third term in power, as the Chinese Communist Party prepares to hold its 20th Congress this coming fall. Beijing claims Taiwan is part of mainland Chinese territory, despite the island's separate constitution and democratically elected leaders. At a foreign affairs briefing, Taiwanese Foreign Minister Joseph Wu said he could not confirm the authenticity of the report. But he added Taiwan is closely monitoring the possibility of an attack from China, and the country is ready to defend itself at any time. The U.S. military released photographs, it says, show an aircraft carrier leading military exercises in the Yellow Sea and air defense artillery going through drills. The photographs show fighter jets taking off from the deck of the USS Abraham Lincoln, with one jet being refueled midair. 
Personnel from U.S. Forces Korea, or USFK, were also pictured going through a drill with a, mass- with a missile system. USFK also says that its air defense brigade at Osan Air Base has increased its exercises to demonstrate its capabilities. That's in response to North Korea's recent missile tests. Japanese media reported a suspected missile launch by nuclear-armed North Korea on Wednesday. And South Korea's military says that North Korea fired an unknown projectile, which appeared to fail immediately after launch. Just ahead, Mercedes-Benz plans to continue a push for electric vehicles, even as supply chain issues make things more difficult for the company. A couple that fled Kyiv now finds themselves in Hungary. They barely know each other and are not sure what to do next. More on that in just a minute here on NTD News. An unthinkable genocide took the lives of six million Jews and thousands of Jewish survivors are still suffering in poverty today. God calls on people who believe in him to act on his word. Comfort ye, comfort my people. Especially during this holiday season of Passover. (laughs) When I come here and I sit with Lily, I realize what she needs right now is food. These elderly Jews are weak and they're sick. They're living on $2 a day. This now is how God's children are living. Take this time to send a survival food box to these forgotten Jews. The International Fellowship of Christians and Jews urgently need your gift of $25 now to help provide one survival food box with all of the essentials they critically need for their diet for one month. Your special holiday gift will provide everything they need to celebrate the holy season of Passover. Do you remember matzah? This is the first time in over 70 years that she has anything to do with faith. She hasn't seen unleavened bread since before the Holocaust. And now we're coming to her and we're saying, it's okay to have faith. For just $25, you can help supply the essential foods they desperately need for one month. For over 35 years, this trusted ministry has given Christians like me a way to tangibly bless Jewish people who are in need throughout the world. God tells us to take care of them, to feed the hungry. And I pray Holocaust survivors will be given the basic needs that they so desperately pray for to survive. The United States and the United Kingdom will kick off trade talks next week. That's according to the British government and the U.S. Office of the Trade Representative. Securing a deal with the United States was one of the main goals in the campaign that led Britain out of the European Union. However, critics say that any deal would take years and never fully compensate for leaving the EU's single market. Discussions will start March 21st in Baltimore, Maryland. They'll be followed by another meeting in Britain later in the spring. The Wall Street Journal reported earlier that the Allies are expected to discuss collaboration on multiple issues, including decarbonizing their economies, promoting digital trade, and easing supply chain congestion. Starbucks' annual shareholders meeting is today. The coffee giant is launching a huge initiative to go greener. It includes adding a charging network for electric cars. NTD's Phil Zoe has more from the Meatpacking District in New York City. Starbucks and Volvo cars are teaming up, offering charging stations for electric cars at up to 15 coffee shops. It's part of a pilot program spanning from the Starbucks headquarters in Seattle all the way to Denver, Colorado. Well, yeah, I mean, if everybody tomorrow bought an electric vehicle, there would be nowhere to charge them. I caught up with coffee drinker and musician Rick Bedrosian right outside of the Starbucks Reserve Roastery in New York City. I think they're a great idea. They just, I think they need to be phased in over a course of probably a few decades. By the end of this year, Starbucks will install as many as 60 of the Volvo branded fast chargers. 
But Bajosian says there's a problem. If there's not enough charging stations, there can't be enough electric vehicles. But if there's you know too many of one and not enough of another, they have to, they both have to sort of expand at the same time. I think. Volvo car owners get to use the charging stations for free, while everyone else will have to pay a fee. Phil Zhou, NTD News, New York. Mercedes-Benz AG won't cut spending on future electric vehicles, even as it copes with supply chain issues made worse by the Russia-Ukraine conflict. That's according to the German automaker's chief executive. Mercedes-Benz says it won't cut spending on electric vehicles, despite growing pressure on the supply chain made worse by the Russia-Ukraine conflict. The crisis has sent gas and mineral prices skyrocketing, challenging the production of both fossil fuel and electric-powered vehicles. However, speaking at the opening of Mercedes' first U.S. EV battery plant in Alabama, CEO Ola Kalenius said they were working around the clock to minimize production disruptions and that its financial outlook was still strong. We always protect the investment into future technology and future products. That is the seed that we will later on harvest. And not even in the COVID year of 2020 did we cut back on the R&D side for the crucial future projects. The Alabama plant will employ 600 workers, part of a $44 billion drive by Mercedes to go all electric by 2030 where markets allow. Kalenius says the war is not stopping Mercedes from making that EV shift and previewed a large electric SUV to be built at a nearby facility in the city of Tuscaloosa later this year. Opening up this battery plant here in Alabama today is a big step in our electrification strategy. And in fact, you can see last year we announced that we think electrification is going to come faster. So we intend to ramp up faster and be ready by the end of this decade to go all electric, electric in markets where the market conditions allow. With the new EVs, Mercedes is joining a growing lineup of electric car makers seeking to challenge Tesla in the U.S., China and Europe. However, Mercedes and other established automakers still trail Tesla in EV sales and the development of new computer and software systems. Russia's economy has fallen further still amid sweeping sanctions from the West. On the streets of Moscow, residents say they see a bleak future for their bank savings, but some believe things will eventually turn for the better. The situation is a dead end. Nothing can be solved now without a change of direction. I took some measures at the very beginning. Now I have increased my expenses, bought some devices I was intending to buy before, but I did not take any drastic measures. I don't do anything with my savings. All the small savings that I have are on deposit account. I trust that everything will be fine. Western sanctions are creating a bleak economic outlook for Russia, edging it out of global markets. The country's financial system and currency are collapsing on multiple fronts. First, Russia's largest bank has been expelled from the global payments network known as SWIFT. That makes it hard to process overseas transactions. Second, Hundreds of billions of dollars held by Russia's central bank stand frozen. In response, the Kremlin had to shut down the stock market and artificially prop up the ruble within its borders. Experts predict the Russian economy will fall back at least 30 years, reaching a level close to the old Soviet times. And on top of that, people's living standards will continue drop for at least the next five years. A Russian-Ukrainian couple that had barely known each other before fleeing from Kyiv is trying to figure out what comes next after arriving in Budapest. But even in the safety of their new city, the couple is finding it difficult to put their traumatic journey behind them. Mikhail Lublin and Valeria Nikolaeva had only been dating for a couple of weeks when they were forced to flee Kiev. Nikolaeva is Ukrainian. Lublin is Russian. I represent some, uh, maybe small, maybe not, uh, population of, of, of Russian people who don't support uh, Russian uh, policy, who don't support Russian president, who uh, don't support Russian government, and who uh, basically uh, want to uh, kind of repay and uh, bear responsibility for what Russia has done. The couple arrived in Budapest, Hungary after a five-day journey. Lublin's Russian nationality added to the complicated situation. 
At first, when we met and I knew that he was Russian, it was a bit weird, but nothing serious. However, when the war started, it was a different story because there was a lot of mistrust from Ukrainian people towards Russians. And I was afraid for him that he would not be liked under these circumstances. It's still hard for them to relax in the safety of their new city. They shudder at sudden noises and police sirens. I hope that we'll be in some uh, safe country where we can build a new life and uh, settle down and wait, wait until uh, this whole craziness is over. Lublin and Nikolaeva are two of the estimated 2.7 million people the UN's refugee agency says have fled Ukraine. Both have professions that could take them anywhere in Europe, but one day they hope to return to Ukraine. New Zealand said today it would open its border for some visitors earlier than previously forecast, hoping an influx of tourists will boost the economy. Vaccinated Australians can travel to New Zealand beginning April 12th. From May 1st, tourists from visa waiver countries such as the United States and Britain will be able to visit. That's according to Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. The border is not expected to fully reopen until October under the current plan, but Ardern said this could happen earlier. All visitors must be vaccinated and provide a negative COVID-19 test before departure. They would be tested on arrival and then on their sixth day in New Zealand. They would not have to isolate. Japan said today it is lifting COVID-19 restrictions imposed on Tokyo and 17 other prefectures. A wave of infections caused by the Omicron variant is ebbing. An Omicron wave led to record infection rates in the capital and throughout Japan in February. It was the nation's deadliest wave of the pandemic so far. Tokyo logged over 10,000 new virus cases on Wednesday. That's down 13.6 percent from a week earlier. The country's prime minister told a news conference that quasi-emergency restrictions would be lifted as of March 21st. He said the country would slowly return to normal. And the government's COVID-19 vaccine booster program has accelerated. About 71% of Japan's vulnerable elderly population have received a third dose. Coming up, stray cats playing around miniature trains have revived a restaurant in Japan on the brink of bankruptcy. Now the restaurant is attracting customers who are cat lovers. Labrador Retrievers continue to be the most popular dog breed in the U.S., and poodles are becoming more popular, according to the American Kennel Club's dog registry. Find out more here in NTD News. A beached pygmy killer whale has been rescued by locals and environmentalists on the shores of Yucatan, Mexico. Volunteers with a group called Youth Allied to the Environment helped carry the orca out of the sea and into a tub to await a medical examination. Yucatan Autonomous University's Marine Biology Department said the orca appeared to have some pulmonary problems. They will see if it needs treatment before being released back into its habitat. The pygmy killer whale is a poorly known and rarely seen oceanic dolphin. Ever wonder what it was like if giant cats were to take over the world? A restaurant in Japan may offer you an idea. The restaurant has come up with a creative way to attract diners and entertain them. Let's take a look. Diorama Cafeteria in Osaka is home to a family of stray cats. They entertain themselves by playing around a miniature railway model installed in the restaurant while customers cheer them on. But the restaurant had not always been this lively. When more people started to work from home, the number of children who came to the restaurant dropped sharply, and of course, the number of customers on weekends also declined. It's like a downward spiral, and we were facing a situation where we can't make our ends meet. The restaurant owner originally planned to create a space where diners can enjoy watching miniature trains running on railway tracks, but everything changed under the pandemic. I was thinking about whether to close down the restaurant or sell the business off at a low price so that it helps everyone. 
As I was deliberating between these two options, those cats appeared, and our lives have been changed by that. The restaurant owner says his staff first found the kitten at a nearby nursery. After taking it in, the kitten's mother started showing up at their door every day along with other baby cats. And thanks to them, the restaurant has come back to life as more cat lovers visited. The way the cat strides between the miniature models really looks like Godzilla. I've never seen it before and it's really interesting. The owner has been uploading videos of the cats playing with the miniature railway model on social media. Several people have made comments. Everyone in the world is going through a tough time due to the pandemic. So after I did something like that, I started to think that even if it's just a small light, I wanted to make it shine upon many people. Now the restaurant is home to 14 cats. What's your favorite dog breed? According to the American Kennel Club, Labrador Retrievers are the most popular breed in the U.S., but poodles are rapidly gaining popularity. Here are the details. The American Kennel Club's annual popularity rankings came out on Tuesday. It was drawn from more than 800,000 purebred dogs that joined the club's registry last year. It's the nation's oldest canine registry. We have the Poodle at number five, which is the first time since 1997. That includes all varieties of the Poodle, standard, toy, and miniature. We have the German Shepherd Dog at number four, our loyal breed, which we absolutely adore. The Golden Retrievers at number three. At number two is the French Bulldog, which is also the most popular dog in New York City. And at number one for 31 years strong is the Labrador Retriever. Historically, Poodles were water retrievers. They were the top dog breed from 1960 to 1982 before falling off in popularity. They are very intelligent, energetic, but they can also sleep on the couch all day long. Um, they have hair, not fur, so they don't shed at all, which is nice if you are allergy prone or if you value hair free clothing. French Bulldogs are number two this time, but back in 2000, they were in 71st place. We had a great secret for a long time. Um, they're wonderful dogs. As with any breed, when it explodes like this, it can be detrimental. But I understand why people love them. Don't expect them to go hiking with you or swimming, but if you want a dog that you can chill with and have a good time with, they're great. And Labrador Retrievers have been topping the list for an unprecedented 31 straight years. They are the perfect size house dog uh, for kids, active families, um, you know, seniors, stuff like that. Very food motivated, easy to train, and they're just lovable. In sixth to tenth place are Bulldogs, Beagles, Rottweilers, German short-haired pointers, and Dachshunds. The list has 197 recognized breeds. New purebred registrations are voluntary, and the club says registrations have increased by 45% in a decade. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.